and AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Welcome everyone to uh, a session on property this week with uh, Christopher Bates. Uh, we, we haven't had it. We've had him on in one of our earliest sessions, actually, uh, when XY Live kicked off, and he's uh, uh, giving us his time again today to talk about he use, how he does property with his clients. Um, a few things to note: we've recently, in the last month, just had another burst in Facebook uh, group growth. We're um, over a hundred people in the last month. We're up to over nine twenty, and um, the activity just keeps on building in there. Um, the Melbourne event, we're almost sold out. Uh, Bill, well done, mate. There's, um, everyone wants to have a bit of whiskey and cigar. And um, what we're going to look at today is, uh, yeah, unpack Chris, uh, Chris's uh, proposition to his clients. He spent a lot of time in this space. A lot of advisors uh, are looking into property, uh, whether it's broking or just wanting to help clients who are struggling to make the right decision around property. Uh, Chris is going to um, walk through um, how he does it and um, hopefully there's going to be some things that people can take away and implement in their business. So Chris, how about we, uh, we kick off and talk a bit about uh, how, uh, what, what your journey's been like in the last few years. Okay, cool. Thanks for um, the invite and good to be here. Loving the uh, XY success. Um, I guess my journey's probably been, been an advisor for 10 years been a, and uh, I'll go back, I go all the way, but five and a half years ago, I um, was looking to get a new job and uh, had a few options and I decided to join a company called Property Planning Australia. Um, and this really was a huge pivot for me in terms of my first five years as an advisor was older clients. It was 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, a couple in their 90s. Um, and when I joined Property Planning Australia, it completely shifted. So it went to clients in their 20s, 30s, 40s. And... Um, yeah, and that, that kind of it moved my advice in a total other direction. Um, I guess the reason I joined them as a business is because their proposition was a bit different to what I'd, I'd seen out there. I, uh, they, had, they incorporated property. They seemed like they knew what they were doing around property. They were very confident. Um, and, um, yeah, and I, I guess I, I didn't know anything about property. Um, and I, I kind of took that, that, I guess, that leap of faith. But after two and a half years there, I kind of realized I wanted to open my own business and started my practice. And since then, I've, I've kind of out there actively kind of saying now that I'm not working with any older clients. I say it in every meeting now that I'm not working with clients over 50. Um, and I guess my kind of proposition is really helping young families, um, I guess, attack their kind of long-term you know, financial challenges, I guess. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of a bit about me. And, and what about with, um, I, know, I know you made a bit of a change in terms of branding in the last couple of years. What was the, um, I, sort of, I, I guess, from what I've gathered, you found a bit more purpose in what your business is about. And what, how, can you tell us a bit about that transition? Yeah. So, you know, when you're starting a new business, you try to come up with a cool name. And uh, so I started with Canopy Private, which really didn't mean anything, really. It was just, you know, uh, a name that I, I thought sounded good and it kind of resonated with, my love of animals, if anything. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I guess I've been moving more and more towards kind of advice around life and well-being, and kind of connecting what we do to someone's purpose. Um, and so I needed a brand that represented that. And um, hence why I rebranded to Wealthful. And the kind of idea behind Wealthful is that money or wealth is whatever you want to believe it is. And that could be not just, you know, financially orientated. It could be lifestyle, it could be purpose, it could be health. Um, so I want to expand the definition of wealth and kind of connect people with that. Um, hence why I decided to rebrand to Wealthful. Yeah, nice one. And, and with what you're doing at the moment, what's your, what's your activity breakdown in terms of how you, um, how you spend your times with clients? What sort of advice has been given? Um, what proportion is debt? What proportion is um, super and insurance and things like that? Yeah, so because it's all younger clients now and most clients come to me via LinkedIn. Um, so they come to me and they've usually been following for a while and they usually come to me with a property related problem. You know, I want to buy a first home. I want to upgrade. I want to renovate. I need to refinance a loan. And 
So a lot of my work is related helping them with those decisions, um, helping them think through you know, whether they should do it or not, and if they are going to do it, you know, how to go about it. Um, and so then that's leading to a lot of the way I get paid is by broking. Um, and so a big part of what I, I guess, percentage of my business is broking. And then after that, once we've sorted out those big decisions, which they are, they're huge decisions, um, we then move on to the other things. And so that might be insurance. That might be, you know, rolling over their super, et cetera. So, you know, as a percentage, broking is definitely, um, from a revenue point of view, a big percentage. Um, but a lot of what I'm doing as well is mindset coaching and behavior coaching and, and actually educating them on what they really want out of life, which I'm not actually getting paid for that. I'm usually getting paid through other forms, I guess. Yeah, well, for those out there that haven't seen link, uh, Chris on LinkedIn, um, you must be living under a rock uh, because <laughs> uh, he's probably the most successful person I've seen on LinkedIn in terms of um, activity and engagement. Um, just while, while we're on that, what the, that link that you're talking about between your social media activity and the success there how, and how that's flowed in, um, how long did it take for that to take off? And how oh, it's, a lo- <laughs> it's a long game. Um, and I, I would say that the re- some of the rewards out of that have probably only happened in the last six months. So last year was quite sporadic. You know, I'd get, you know, a couple of months, you know, new clients from it. Um, but now it's probably to a couple of weeks. So, um, you know, I, I, two and a half years I've been kind of on there. I, for the first year I was writing, you know, long form articles and very financially driven um, and I've just stopped doing that really. I very rarely do it now. Um, and now it's just daily updates. So I do, I've been consistently doing one a day, but in the last probably three to six months, I've upped it to two a day. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's a long, long term game. Mate, every time I go on LinkedIn, uh, which is about two times a week, I only see your face. I'm like, this is <laughs> like not connecting with you because I only see you. You're posting a photo and a brief kind of. Uh, yeah. right. I think it's <laughs> yes, it sounds like there could be a little bit of jealousy, Phil. You're not getting no, those videos. Your videos. Yeah, I'm not jealousy at all. I think you're, you're killing me. I, I love it. But, uh, uh, but for someone who's probably not going to use your services, it's kind of like oh, I, like LinkedIn is just Chris Bates. Uh, Chris Bates app. You know, <laughs> daily updates of Chris. Well, and we just yeah. saw they, they they're going to allow videos. So you got any ideas around that, Chris? What you're going to be doing? Uh, I think it's just going to flood it. And I actually don't, I'm not really a fan of it, to be honest. Um, you know, you can already see, you know, that many videos going on there and they're average at best. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be interested to see how it works. I think someone's got to do something different. Um, yeah. Just, just moving on to that LinkedIn. I think you really uh, hit the nail on the head with LinkedIn, just posting a photo and then kind of a, an insightful kind of comment around that photo. Um, how did you come out like around, um, you know, realizing that that's really what LinkedIn is loving? Cause it seems from my LinkedIn, it seems like, it seems like that's what LinkedIn loves to show everyone. Yeah. I mean, it has, it's recently shifted to this kind of where you post a longer form and you have to press see more. So it's like this clickbait kind of things hit in the last couple of months. I haven't been doing that. Um, where someone would write, I don't know, maybe a few hundred words. Um, and the only way you can read those hundred, few hundred words, you've got to click, click more. Um, and so they're very, very common on LinkedIn right now. But before you couldn't do that, um, you only had to kind of, and so if you just wrote something, then it would kind of get lost. So the picture basically is what stops them. Um, and then if the picture resonates, and then I guess if you flick through LinkedIn, you can very quickly see why something's not getting liked or something's not, you know, getting shared. Um, it's either not personal enough, it's not well articulated, it's not interesting, it's self-promotion, um, you know, it's what everyone else is writing. You know, it has to be unique. It has to be something that resonates and is authentic to you. And so I guess that's kind of my philosophy on it, I guess. Well, it sounds yeah, like we'll need to do a, another session on LinkedIn um, <laughs> in a few months, I think. But yeah. We'll do all day about it. And to be honest, Chris, I've seen quite a few other people, um, it, you know, I'm going to say that they're just copying you. Um, you know, I've seen <laughs> other people in my networks go, look at what Chris is doing, seeing he's killing it, um, and, and just kind of doing the similar thing, which is great, you know. Oh, every idea comes from somewhere, so no one's unique, so. <laughs> yeah, cool. 
Yeah, well, yeah, you're doing a great job, mate. Thanks, it up. appreciate it. <laughs> the, um, so let's let's bring it back to property. So you get you get a client in, and you're talking, you're working through the behaviour piece, the sort of dreams, the aspirations piece, and 100 percent of the time you end up at property. Is that how it works? Uh, well, I mean, to be honest, the biggest challenge young clients is 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 their family home, right? So. I work in mainly Sydney and Melbourne and we're after a boom. Um, and so, you know, they've got to make a decision on that. If you're looking at uh, pieces in their puzzle for their life, um, where they're going to live long-term is a huge piece. It's the biggest piece, you know, are we going to rent long-term or especially if you're pre kids or you've got kids that security around your home, whether you're in a home now and you need to renovate it or whether you need to upgrade or, getting a solution for that is, is, is the first thing I think every advisor needs to consider because, you know, that's their biggest, you know, if they know they're going to live in an area and they've got a house and it's already paid off and yeah. Okay. Then we can move to what's where to from here. But if they haven't got over that hurdle yet, it's just going to be something that's constantly in their mind. And secondly, you know, how can you advise someone what to do with their savings or to put more money into super if they haven't got this biggest question answered? Um, so, you know, a lot of the time it's talking them through that from a lifestyle point of view and, you know, getting them very, it, we're getting to a bit of a crossroads, I think now where people are basically having to really consider, you know, can they actually get a home that's big enough that's actually going to suit their lifestyle and give them a life that they want long term um, in Sydney or Melbourne um, without going into enormous debt and then that then leading to having to, earn a very high income and then to save a lot of money to kind of support that life. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of the time it's talking that through um, and then trying to come up with, you know, different ways to cut the pie. You know, if, if that, if that's not possible, then do they look at, you know, rent vesting, you know, and getting comfortable with that. Um, I guess property does lead itself to younger clients as a better asset class, just purely down to leverage. You know, if you've got 150 grand, you can go buy a million dollars worth of property, but you know, you're not going to leverage that six times into the share market. You know, you, you, you'd be feeling you'd struggle to do it twice. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of, and especially not only leverage today, but it's future leverage. So if you buy a property and it goes up in value, you can then redraw on that equity and then you can go buy your shares, you know, but if your shares double, you can't then go back to the bank and then just kind of say, well, now I want to, you know, reborrow against them. You know, it's, it's a, such a long-term play. Um, and so, you know, I think that's why generally speaking, when you're younger, it makes a lot more sense to look at property. Are there but any, property, are there any yeah. particular trends that you're seeing in terms of um, how, how young people are reacting to the high prices and sort of out of the box ideas that you're working through with them? Yeah, I think, hot spotting and investment property magazines and all this, you know, and, and trying to pick the next hot market in property. It, it doesn't work like that. And, you know, you can um, throw all your eggs into one property, which you're usually doing. And if that doesn't work out, then, you know, you're taking extreme risk. Um, so that's something that I, I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing people take punts on new property and things like that. And it's another example of what, you know, you shouldn't be doing. Um, so I think, the biggest trend is people are stretching and they're buying their future home today. So, you know, even if you are 30, you're trying to buy a house that you're going to move into when you're 40 and you're going to rent it out for five or 10 years. Um, and you're going to get comfortable renting on a lower income today. So you're buying your home that you want to live in in 2028 or 2023, but you're buying it in 2017 or 2018 mm -hmm. and you're negatively gearing it for six or eight years or whatever. So, you know, that's, a, you know, a, a good solution, I guess. That's one kind of option. Yeah, interesting. So, so with, um, with this process, so like uh, we've gotten to the property stage, what, how do you help them decide? What do you, what are the sort of, what's the framework you go through? What are the sort of steps that you walk through with them? Okay, so my clients are generally, um, you know, a family and they're usually on double incomes. And when you add up those double incomes, you know, we're talking two to $500,000 usually. So, you know, their borrowing capacity isn't really an issue. So they can usually go borrow, you know, a couple of million dollars without any problems. 
their challenge is, is usually savings. So, you know, have they got the savings or the equity to allow them to, to actually purchase good assets? Um, and to buy good assets is expensive. So, you know, if someone comes to me and they've got fifty or seventy thousand dollars and they're looking to buy a house a million bucks, it's just my advice is to keep saving. You know, um, you know. But if they come to me and they've got, you know, three four hundred thousand dollars, you know, then we start to consider. Well, what sort of asset do we do we lead towards? Do we look to buy a future home? You know, do we spend money on renovating? So we just it, there's not a kind of a cookie cutter approach, but it's the philosophy is always: Can you afford to get quality assets? And if you can't you know, either consider looking at other investing or look at saving more um, or super and things like that. And so, yeah, the process is a kind of 69, 15-minute phone call and that's, I'm getting better and better at kind of, you know, only letting, I guess, the clients that can really help go through. Um, and, you know, that's, that's leading to better outcomes. And then I guess 69 minute meeting where we discuss life and all their biggest challenges and then we, we kind, of, kind of map out what we need to do from there. Do you, do you have any key filter questions in that 15 minute phone call? I just, they have to be past the initial kind of, I want to save and I've got $30,000. Um, you know, they have to probably, you know, be really trying to take it seriously. So when someone's trying to park the meeting and they're moving it and they've kind of got a, it's probably more of a behavioral, emotional, I mean, a new client yesterday, you know, they've got $50,000, but he's an architect, the wife's an interior designer. You know, they're probably not going to be a client yet. You know, but in five years' time, they've got all the right behaviours, they've got the right attitude, they're smart. So I'm happy to spend, sit down with them for, you know, 60, 90 minutes and just get them on the right path. Um, but they might not turn into a long-term, you know, a short-term client, but mentally they're the right type of client. So, um, you know, that's what I, and vice versa, a new client this morning, um, you know, he sends a text message and it's more of a like throwing mud at the wall philosophy can you help me with this loan? I really want a quick deal, you know, and they kind of expecting you to work miracles. Um, and, you know, when I speak to him on the phone, he's not really to take responsibility and to really, and so, you know, I'm not going to really invest a lot into that, but I'm going to invest a lot into the other guy. And, and what kind of things are you doing in the meantime? So they may be a client in five years time. Are you doing anything with them in the meantime or just staying connected? I used, I did go down that cash flow route and I, I did, you know, use some software and I did try to become, I just didn't like being dad, I guess. And, you know, and telling someone, you know, to, not to save money or to save money. I kind of, I want to push the ball into their court and go, it's up to you really. You know, if you really want to take this seriously, you can do it. I give them a system. I give them a, a process and I just say, look, this is how I do it. And this is how I think the best way to run it is. Um, and then it's up to them if they want to go and implement and actually save. Um, just to get into more details, when you say you give them a system, is it just more like, here's my framework, take it and work it out? Or yeah, I just give it away, my cash flow system, and just say, so this is how I do it, this is how I recommend you should do it, and if you want to do it, this is how I would do it. And, um, and rather than, I don't really believe in the kind of the app thing, I kind of looked at it all, and I, I just don't, I think it's more of a behavioral kind of system that you need to have and stop the way you're currently doing it and start again. And then, and then structure it this way. So, that's, sounds like it could be a referral opportunity, uh, Chris. Yeah, I don't. I just don't want to get there. Yeah, I just don't want to get into the cash flow. And yeah, that's kind of my my view on it. I think if you're serious enough, you, you're gonna. You don't need someone to tell you to save. You know, it's it's a behavioural spending thing. That's my view. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. So, um, so you, they've sort of you've gone through that process with them. That someone that's committed to buying a property. Uh, now what? So if they've got the housing, their family home issue sorted and they're on top of their debt. So I, I built my own calculator to figure out what's too much debt for someone. And I, I take them through that process and explain, look, the bank wants you to pay it off over 30 years and that's $4,000 a month. Um, but the bank wants you to pay it off over 30 years so they can make a lot of interest off you. Secondly, you know, if you get interest rate rises or you don't earn as much money in the future, um, you're only going to you know, feel stressed about this minimum repayment. So if you can only afford you know, $4,000 a month, you've got way too much debt. You need to be saving five, six, seven, eight thousand $8,000 a month. So I go them through what I believe they need to be saving per month to actually pay off their mortgage. And so I walk mm -hmm. them through that. If that's comfortable and they're on top of their debt and they've got equity, 
Um, we then can't consider, well, how much equity have they actually got? And, you know, if they've got a lot, if they've got little, like 50, 100 grand, I don't think, I don't consider that a lot of equity. You know, I think that's just a small buffer. You know, you've only got to send a small decrease to their house value and then that equity gets blown out. So if they've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars of equity, now we're starting to talk through and go, well, why don't we use some of that equity to work for you? And depending on their borrowing capacity, mm-hmm. we start saying, well, now you've got the equity, you've got the incomes, you've got the serviceability, you can go borrow a million dollars. And so if you can afford a million dollars, we then start thinking what would be an actual quality asset to get, you know, what drives the property market and what sort of assets should you be looking for? And so then you're looking at something to get something with small, like a limited supply um, is the first thing. And that's usually housing. And the problem with housing though, you, it's cost a lot of money in the capital cities. So then we start talking through, well, how does the property market in capital, you know what I mean? So then we start going into detail of what drives the property market. And if they're going to spend a million dollars, what type of assets should they look for? Um, and then we go through that process. So with with the um, with those metrics, I'm curious about the ones, the filter metrics, because I think um, I guess especially if the off the back end of um, debt, um, in terms of doing a loan, obviously that's how people get paid, and um, there's that. Arguably, there's a bit of a conflict. Like, I'm a mortgage broker as well, and you're sort of there going, well, um, we've got to, like, I don't get paid if the loan doesn't go through, but then you've got a client on the other hand, and um, mortgage brokers don't have best interest duty, but we're advisors, obviously, and the way you go about it is being an advisor. What are those metrics that you you put in place? Because I know a lot of um, people sort of struggle to, how do you actually, um, where do you draw the line? Hmm. So I think, Fundamentally, the you know, if you are looking to worried about getting paid, I think you're already losing because you know that's not a really, I guess, a way of approaching it. You need to disconnect yourself from the outcome of you know whatever the advice is, the best advice. So I guess that's the the first thing is you need to mentally do that. You know, you need to mentally just be committed to giving the best advice. Um, so, Chris, I'll just challenge you on that. Um, yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> that's an easy assumption to say, disconnect the outcome to the advice. But uh, fundamentally, with mortgage working in, um, the outcome is how you get paid. So how do you, how do, you do that? Um, it's just, it's, just it's, it's an inbuilt thing that you've got to kind of, you know, so it's like if a client comes to me and they say they want to buy an off-the-plan unit, I would say, look, I'm not going to support, I'm, I would educate them on why I do not believe in that, why I think that's a stupid idea and why they should consider alternative options. And if I lose them as a client, I lose them as a client. I, don't, I, I would not feel comfortable doing that. If they're looking to, if they've signed a contract on it, I've even asked got clients to, you know, really reconsider whether they should even go through and, and buy that property. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and so I would, you know, and if I lose clients from that, which you very rarely do, um, because they're going to value that advice, um, then, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the fundamental thing. If a client wants, has got a borrowing capacity of $300,000 and they've got $50,000 in the bank, I would say, I don't believe you can go get a quality property. If they start saying, well, I can go get something up in Townsville, or I can buy a DHS property or something like that, I would go say, I wouldn't do it, you know, and I don't want, and so I just don't, I wish I wouldn't have that as a client, you know, because I just don't fundamentally believe in what, that's the right thing that they should do. Um, and so I, I just really challenge the client on, on making sure that they're not just doing something because they feel like they should do it or they've been told to do it or something like that. And, you know, so I know that every single property that every single client's bought, I, I'm supporting, I know I've lost clients from that. I know I have where they've wanted to do something and I'm not going to be the facilitator for it because I don't believe in the asset they're buying. Yeah. So, um, so you draw, you draw a line on the assets, but what about those um, metrics around, um, what's, is it, is it a good idea to actually purchase something? So you said you don't believe in the 30 year, um, uh, I guess, affordability piece. Um, do you bring that, do you say how, how much would they need to pay per month to pay it off over 10 years or 20 years? Yeah, exactly. So it's, a, I call it zero to 10. I think if you can save like X amount per month and pay your loan off in zero to 10 years, you're smashing it. You're taking off right, way too little, you know, manageable debt you don't have to stress about it you know if you can save ten thousand dollars a month and you take out a mortgage for 
you know, eight hundred thousand dollars, you've got nothing to worry about. You know, if it's going to take you ten to fifteen years, I think you're still quite comfortable. You know, bear in mind the bank says thirty. If it's fifteen to twenty, I call that uncomfortable. And anything over twenty, I think you're taking way too long. And I, I just couldn't do it. And so it's this fifteen years is kind of my magic number. This is something that I've just kind of, you know, I educate my clients on, and that spits out in a month an amount per month. And if they can't save that amount per month, I really challenge whether they should be doing it or not. Um, and so, because you're just going to hamstring yourself, you're just going to have this huge debt over your head. You know, if there's any correction in any kind of reduction in the property price or your income doesn't rise like you think it's going to rise, um, you know, you're going to find it very difficult to get ahead by building equity. So that's kind of my philosophy. Yeah. yeah. So, Chris, how, how does that play out um, when you see a client? Do they, um, you know, most people will, will probably do a borrowing capacity calculator before they might come and see you or some people will. So they'll know how much debt they can take on and then they start looking at properties around that figure. How do you then go, actually, let's dial that down. Do you, do you have a conversation of going, reduce the, um, you know, the property price and therefore move further out or smaller property? Or do you do the strategy you were talking about before saying, hey, let's buy that 10-year house and rent vest? Um, how do you manage okay. that expectation from the clients? So they need, a, they need 17%. At least, so from I don't really I don't do loans over ninety percent. I just I just don't believe in it. I think you've you, you've if you've only got enough savings just to cover eight percent deposit, like a you pay a ridiculous mortgage insurance, and then also you've got means you've got no buffer. So and I so firstly they need the savings to get the seventeen percent, and then also you know they want to get a quality asset. So you know if they're borrowing capacity, it's all about just getting quality assets. So. You know, and, you know, if they have got their housing issue sorted, if they haven't got their housing issue sorted, we've got to consider, do we buy our future home today or do we buy our first home? So you've got to get through that hurdle. But if you're through that, then it's basically saying, look, if you've only got a borrowing capacity of 500 grand, you know, I, would really, I think you're really going to struggle to get a quality property. But if you've got a borrowing capacity of a million, you're going to struggle to get a good house in Melbourne. It's, it's going to get, I believe, you know, and I'm, and at the current market, but you might be able to pick up a house in Brisbane for 750, but then you've got to understand the challenges of investing in Brisbane compared to Sydney, Melbourne, and how it's a complete different market. So, you know, that's kind of the philosophy behind it is it's, it's I guess, helping them understand that to get good assets, you need a lot of borrowing capacity. You know, I don't believe in a, you know, picking up $300,000 properties and getting a portfolio of, Three and a half million over twelve properties. It just doesn't. It doesn't work like that. It, it's just you're taking. You're buying lower quality. Yes, you've got more quantity, but you're buying lower quality and lower quality. You've got higher risks and will get less and lesser returns long term. So on on those um, in terms of like the selection, have, what about Domacom and BrickX? Have you had a good look at them? Yep. So. You know, I, I just, I, sorry, just for anyone listening, Domacom and BrickX are sort of broken down ways to get exposure to property. Um, they do, they both do it a little bit differently and Chris might sort of give a bit of a breakdown. On yep. That. So a bit of disclosure, I actually arranged all the loans for BrickX. So I'm the broker for, for BrickX, but that's well just to, to, to explain that. But the, you know, and that's, but I, it's not something that, you know, so that's, there's something there, but in terms of their, in terms of an actual new way of investing, BrickX is actually buying quality property. So they're actually buying houses, they're buying low unit blocks in quality suburbs. And so from a long-term investment point of view, if you do what you need to do with property and invest long-term, and long-term is not five years, it's 30, 40 years, um, you're gonna get good results because you're buying quality property. And so, etc. cetera. Domacom is more of a, you know, a collective kind of, you put all your money together and the way that that would really work is if you're buying quality assets and you need to really question whether what you're buying there is a quality asset or not. Because property investing only works if you get quality assets. So Domacom can work if you get together with five or 10 investors and you go out and buy an amazing commercial property and it's got a great yield and it does really well. Yep, maybe. Um, and then there's other ones popping up, like there's Covesta and there's a few others that'll keep coming. Fractional property investing will be a way of the future, purely down to able to get diversification over many properties very simply and mm. save all the times about trying to get asset selection. Um, 
And Property Partner in the UK, I think it's got over 200 properties now. So if you can imagine the BrickX platform with 200 properties all over the country, you could build a portfolio of a million dollars over 20 properties, 50 grand in each. And so no matter what's happening in Australia, you could have you know, a million dollars and protect yourself in case there is a, a shutdown to the mining boom in Perth or that Adelaide doesn't take off or, you know, et cetera. So, uh, but it Do comes down to quality those- assets. Do you see them making their way? Because I know my understanding is BrickX is a unitized vehicle, so like a managed fund. Do you see them making their way onto a wrap platforms? I think they definitely should. Um, the challenge they've got is they've got individual the assets. They've got, um, yeah, I mean, the problem they've got is the individual assets, right? So to actually get, you have to get individual properties onto the platform. Mm. So where it actually changes, though, is when you've got an index. And so you've got a properties of 100 properties and you can buy BrickX as an index, that's when... A bit of liquidity and Bob's your uncle. There you go. So I can see that happening for sure. Yeah, because like you, I think um, people, um, the attachment to property would extend into super as well if people um, had the opportunity to. Just so. Yeah. I mean, I don't think whether you should put in, you've got most, you know... There's $7 trillion in property or something like that. And there's $2 trillion in super, you know. So property outside on, on its own asset class is huge, you know. So, um, you know, and most people's wealth is already tied to the property market. And so then pumping your super with property, um, you know, you can see there's going to be problems here. So, you know, leveraging up in super to buy, you know, which is I get, you know, almost weekly from clients asking to leverage their super fund up into property. You know, it's not a good idea just to be putting everything into property. Um, so you look you know, at it as hedging of your bets sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah, so with, with, um, with property, like the licensee structure that we deal with in Australia can often be quite challenging around and very, um, I guess, scare a lot of advisors away from doing anything in the property space. What are your, how do you navigate that? And what are your suggestions for people who want to explore a bit, but don't want to step on any compliance people's toes? Yeah. So the first thing to remember is that the property market is unregulated, right? So when you go out there and you want to help people with the property market, you got to realize that when they go out to the property market and try to help themselves is they go into an unregulated environment and they get absolutely sold to. So, uh, you need to make sure as an advisor, you're not the one who's getting sold to as well because there's hundreds and hundreds of different companies exist out there and they partner with advisors, they partner with accountants and they sell the accountant and they sell the advisor because they pretend that they're the expert and they, they then get the advisor and the accountant to refer to their business and this is your direct property solution and that then funnels the client into sell, buying new property. So the first advice I would say, any advisor, do not fall for it. Do not fall for new property and partnering with these organizations. Um, and that's the, and, and, and even worse, don't ever take a kickback. So if you want to refer to a buyer's agent, never take a kickback. You know, never take a, um, anything. As soon as you do, you start tying yourself to organizations. You've got to, and you've got to stay completely independent from the property decision. So if you want to help people with property, don't partner with any organizations. That, and secondly, don't even partner with individual buyer's agents. Stay independent. Have multiple buyer's agents. So if you're introducing a buyer's agent, introduce three. You know, introduce a multiple options to them because buyer's agents by themselves you know, are only going to be experts in certain suburbs at certain points and to, to narrow someone's search down to what that one buyer's agent's doing is being a little bit ignorant that they can't be the, across the whole property market. So they need to get varied opinions for different suburbs and different states. So when you get into the asset selection, you know, that's where it's going to come back and bite you. If you've said, you referred to this company, that company invested in a, you know, a house and land packages in the growth corridor of Brisbane or something nonsense. And then that doesn't go up or that goes back in value. The client's going to come all the way back to you and say, you told me to do that because um, you introduced me to this company. 
Yeah, I totally agree, Chris. I, I refer to buyer's agents and I've, I went out because I wasn't doing it and it's a massive you know, asset for clients and lots of my clients are asking about it. So I went out and met probably 15 buyer's agents. Perfect. Knocked a whole bunch back and said I would never go near them myself. So I never yeah. got to send a client to them. And yeah, just had a panel of different buyer's agents that I refer my clients to. Uh, yeah, t- totally agree. And kickbacks is kind of a, it's kind of a no-brainer. Just, just, it's not that hard. Uh, it is a no-brainer, but it still happens every day. You know, it's pretty scary yeah. what's happening. But let's let's just go back to that licensee issue because you talk a lot about quality assets for clients. So you, you obviously go into discussion with your clients about, you know, what makes up a good house, what makes up a bad house, what is, in your definition, a quality property. How does that, how do you manage the licensee arrangement around, is, is this all, because imagine the general versus personal advice is very muddy in that space that you're talking about. Yeah, so I'll never talk about suburbs, you know. I'll never talk about streets. I'll never talk about, um, you know. I'll give feedback, but the feedback I give is from a high level, you know. It's, it's okay, you want to buy 40 k from the city and I'll educate them on how a ripple, of work, ripple effects works with growth and how it goes the other way. If they want to buy an off-the-plan unit or I'll explain them how oversupply and how the investor market drives that market and how that's taking a risk. So I'm just, I just educate them on a risk management point of view and talk to them about kind of from a demographics point of view and growth and, and things like that, how to reduce the risk. So all the property kind of solution that I'm talking about are very kind of low risk, low supply, high demand properties. And that's what I kind of drum in. And then I say, look, I'm not going to be the expert in terms of selecting properties. You know, you need to use a buyer's agent for that. And then I educate them on how a buyer's agent works. And after using a buyer's agent, you know, you know multiple times and seeing client outcomes, um, you can really kind of understand how they add value. And I educate them on why they should use a buyer's agent. Um, and so that's kind, of, that's kind of, from a licensee point of view, I cut myself at the asset selection. So look, this is not my yeah, yeah. cup of tea. And then I, I end it there. Yeah. And I mean, using a buyer's agent is kind of a no-brainer. Saying, "Hey, you, you're coming to me for advice, and you want to buy your biggest asset. Why wouldn't you get advice?" <laughs> it's kind of an, an easy win for that referral from an advisor. Let's. We've got some um, people watching on Facebook Live who have got some questions, and we've got some people uh, live in Zoom. I don't know, um, but Dylan. Um, has asked, uh, okay, he asked a while ago, Chris, I see you're big, you're big on exploring values with clients. How do, you, uh, how do your conversations take place around helping clients understand when there's a conflict between their goals uh, they come to you with and the values that you uncover? Uh, that's question one. Uh, I think this is so valuable and doing it more and more with younger families. So Dylan's doing a lot of this work. So, yeah, how do you, how do you um, manage? Clients got, uh, you know, you're uncovering values, but they say they want something different. How do you manage that process? I mean, I guess I could just, I guess it's being authentic and being real in the conversation to give yourself the right to ask that question firstly. So, you know, you've got to, I guess, understand what's really driving them. And I guess if, if, they're, if they're wanting, you know, a house and, they, and they're saying that they want to work less or something like that, You've got to then really say, well, this is really, you've got to really, really challenge them that they do do this. This is actually going to have consequences on their income. And so you actually then go and say, is that really going to give you the flexibility to, you know what I mean? So I guess it, you know, if the values are, you know, or whether it's even working. So there's a client who I've got as a CFO, um, you know, he was working, he was, he says he's a family man, but he wasn't being a family man, right? So, you know, I, I guess, you know, I think I've got the right to help him to question whether he should even be doing what he's doing because he's not getting ahead. You know, he's got a stupid mortgage, he's stressed, et cetera. So, you know, I think that's where it comes to. I think you kind of, to actually go in and question someone, you think you've got to get the right to, to know that they've got your best interest, you've got their best interest at heart. Um, so I think it's, it's not something you can easily just pop into the first question, I think, if, you know, they're living their life and it's nothing to do with their values. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's quite, quite a personal thing. Yeah, and more and more, I know I'm dealing with it and just being up front and saying, look, my value to, to you is just to be candid and, and I'm generally relatively good at that and just kind of 
um, being open and candid with clients and just going, look, if I don't think you're doing the right thing, I'll let you know. Um, and yeah, that, that family man piece is kind of big. Um, you know, that's I say so very, 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 very similar. I just say, look, you know, the way I'll give advice is that it's always, you know, it's quite sometimes blunt. It can be upfront. It's sometimes not what you want to hear. And, you know, but it's always coming from the right place. And so I just, mm-hmm. I would say something like that on the, on the phone and, you know, or, and when I am in meetings, if they're doing something that I don't agree with or they've bought properties that aren't good, I'll always just tell them and I'll just explain. But I'll explain why I think what they've done isn't a good decision for them long term and I'll highlight risks and things like that, knowing that when they go home, they go, no one's really told me that before. No one's really said what I'm doing is wrong. And after a while, that'll sink in and then they'll understand it more and they'll come back to you and they'll respect you so much more. Mm. So we've got another question from Lee Smith. Uh, he says, how are you finding being in both financial planner and mortgage broker? Um, so how do you keep up to date with both hats and you know, what are the difficulties with it? Oh, it's, it's not easy at all. I would say that I was working with brokers for the first 18 months um, before I decided to become a broker. So I was doing joint meetings with brokers and um, I'll admit this, that um, I thought it would be easier than it is. Um, and I thought, well, I'll, I was generating a lot of business for so these joint meetings. I'll generate a lot of business for him. I was like, well, why don't I just do this? I can actually add a lot of value here. I actually enjoy the conversation. Why don't I just become a broker? Um, and it's not that simple. And I think um, it's been a journey. I think I've got to a position now where I've got my process with mortgages and understanding banks and complexity and credit, and I can not waste time so I can be much more efficient with broking, which means that I can then actually now extend my knowledge. So I think I've had to get my education from here to here when I actually thought it was a lot easier. So it hasn't been an easy journey and it's not, especially with mortgages, it's, it's a constantly ever changing beast. And um, the planning side, I just keep my advice really simple. So, you know, I don't go in, I don't believe in building investment portfolios anymore. You know, I, believe in kind of index funds. I believe in focusing on, you know, your behaviors and things like that. So I don't go out for coffees with, you know, fund managers anymore or anything like that. You know, I just cut all that out and I just stick to what I believe in. I just don't get surrounded with the noise. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that's kind of how I, so keeping up to date with the planning side, obviously all the legislation and things like that, you can do it. Um, it's just, I don't get, a lot of time wasted in advice is probably around technology, which I've been guilty of and investments. And mm-hmm. so I just don't get dragged there as much anymore. And the strategies, I guess, are just not as complex with, with younger clients. They just really aren't like, uh, unless you've got someone with huge amounts of income that you may need to do some, you know, contributions and stuff. It's just really not that complex. It's pretty simple. Um, and that's, and that's, you- a, that's a key reason why I stopped working with the older clients as well. Yeah. Um, is because I, I was I was in this my headspace is like this and then I have to do this and then it's it's you know the time to actually build that advice and actually get and, and everything to, that goes with it it's just not worthwhile doing um, so I've just made that business call is that I'm only going to work with younger clients and then I, I'll just nail all the strategies there and become the expert in that yeah yeah so Dylan's also asked another thing just thoughts on uh, buyers agent value to buyers um, just just give us more info so. Quick, I'll give you one minute because we are quickly running out of time. Um, you know, what is the real value for a buy from to use a buyer's agent? It, it comes on many, many different levels. Um, fundamentally, in a hot market, in a cold market, they can get something that you, you know, and they negotiate and things like that. In a hot market, everyone knows it's a good property. So the key is actually getting access to that property, either pre-market or off-market, which a buyer's agent's got a better chance than any other puncher on the street. And secondly, when they find that property, getting the actual deal done and actually getting a signed contract is extremely difficult because you've got an overinflated vendor who wants an X price and a buyer's agent who wants to pay this. And the real estate agent has to get that deal done. And so a buyer's agent, you know, in, it's a little bit of a secret hidden club that no buyer's agents and no real estate will talk about. But behind the scenes, deals are getting done because buyer's agents and real estate agents are making deals. And the average punch on the street doesn't get access to making those deals. And so 
you know, the buyer's agent scratching the real estate's back and, the, and, and vice versa. And that's just because they're both independent from the transaction. And so if you're going to talk about the value, even just for that, getting the deal done, it's extremely valuable. There's good property. Everyone knows what a good property is. And there's 15 people trying to buy it. So how do you become the one? And the only way you become the one is getting someone to actually do you a favor. And they do favors to buyer's agents, not to punters. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And they know buyer's agents are going to come back. They know buyer's agents are legit. If they say this is what I'm going that's, to pay, there's no nothing around there. That's so true. So if you, you're, you're a real estate agent and you've got a, you, you don't know who's the real buyer, you've got dreamers, you've got people who are, you know, you know, all sorts of stuff and you don't know who the real buyers are. But if you've got a buyer's agent who you've dealt with before, they've got a pre-approved customer and they'll get the deal done. So if you're a real estate agent, you're going to do preference to a buyer's agent because they're going to get the deal done. And yeah. so that's kind of how it works. Yeah. So just uh, last question, uh, who's your dealer group or licensee, Chris? Uh, Madison. Madison, cool. Nice one. Chris, epic session, mate. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people have got value out of it. Um, a few highlights. Uh, um, if anyone's trying to get into LinkedIn and figure out how to do it well, just copy what Chris is doing. Um, property exactly. camping. Exactly, just copy exactly. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> much copy and paste, yeah. Um, <laughs> you can do property as an advisor and you can do it well and you can keep it compliant, uh, I guess is one, one key takeout. And then the other thing is um, buyers, agents add value. Like that, that last bit I think was really good because a lot of advisors, as Dylan was asking, um, arming and ahhing about the value, they don't have much experience with dealing with these guys. Um, by the sounds of it, both your experience and Phil's experience, it's, it's definitely a good idea to shop around and, um, and do a bit of uh, research around who you deal with there. Yep. So, uh, mate, thanks for your time. Uh, Appreciate shout it. Shout out to AIA for uh, sponsoring the, the session. Thanks for partnering with us and uh, see everyone in the Facebook group. Good times ahead. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Cheers. See you, bye.